All right, so welcome everyone. Thanks for persisting to the very last talk at the end of the second day. Um, obviously, it's not quite as exciting to do the top 10 this time than it was when I did it six months ago um, because six months ago nobody knew what was in the list. So there's a little of uh, suspense involved in teaching the, and showing it for the first time. Uh, obviously, it's been out for a couple months now, so you, hopefully, most of you already know what's in it. Um, so the, I'm, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time focusing on each top 10 item. I am going to go through each one, but I want to spend most of my time talking about the top 10 project, the philosophy around the project, and uh, why we made the updates that we made uh, this year. So I'm Dave Wickers. I'm one of the OWASP board members. I'm the OWASP conferences chair. I'm the OWASP top 10 project lead. I'm an ASAPI project lead contributor, and in my day job, I work for my own company, Aspect Security, in the States. So, let's get going. So, what did we do this year in the top 10 that we hadn't done before? Well, a little history on the top 10. We first published it in 2003. Um, and we were quite amazed at the amount of attention that that particular document got. Um, the OWASP website went down the day we published it because it got slash dotted and our server couldn't handle it. So uh, we've grown from that to where we are today. We did an update in 2004 and then we did another update in 07 and finally this update in 2010. And I think every three years is a good tempo because if I had to do it every two years, it's too much work. Um, so, one of the things we thought about, how do we make it much better? So, one of the things we did was actually to make it shorter. So, I don't know if you guys have ever actually read the top 10 of 07 versus 2010. Um, we made the document about uh, maybe two-thirds of the size of the last one because we're trying to make it more consumable. It's more about awareness than anything else. The other thing we did was try to think about, you know, who are the people using this document? Now, if it's purely awareness for developers, then getting a list out of 10 items and regardless of their order is, is kind of sort of equivalent um, to them. But we were saying organizations need this top 10 list as the 10 things to focus on in their organization. And what do organizations care about? So in your organization, is who, who thinks that the prevalence of a flaw is the most important factor in do I get rid of this problem? Anyone think prevalence is the most important thing? What about impact? Is the impact of a vulnerability the most important thing? Who thinks that? Maybe a few of you, right? Well, to me, I think it's the risk that that vulnerability brings to the table, right? Which is a combination of likelihood of attack, likelihood of existence, likelihood of discovery, likelihood of ex successful exploit, and of course the impact that that does to a system. So anyone who does risk management in any technology field or non-technology field for that matter is focusing on risk. So we thought that was really fundamental and we probably should have done this many years ago, but we didn't. So that's what the top 10 is about now. It's about risks. So. Hopefully, we've got it in a reasonably generic order that the higher risk items are on the top of the list. And that way, if you're spending your energy on the items in order from 1 to 10, hopefully you're reducing the most risk the fastest. That was the goal. Now, that caused some things to fall out of the list. And some of those were controversial, like dropping information leakage and error handling. Information leakage and error handling are incredibly prevalent issues. No question. Tools are really good at finding them. You throw a bunch of garbage at an application and it throws a whole bunch of errors back at you. Right? That's how they work. Sometimes those are stack traces, so we call those information leaks or uh, little chunks of SQL code or whatever. But it was our thought that the underlying root cause of a lot of those information leaks is probably the more important risk. So if you fuzz something and you get a stack trace back or you get a piece of SQL back, probably you've got like a SQL injection flaw. So fix that first, because that's where the biggest risk is. And then if you have time, of course, 
fix your error handling and, and things like that. So we're not trying to say that the things that fell off the list aren't important, because they're all important to some degree, but it's all a relative uh, issue. So that's just an example of why that one particular issue uh, fell out. So to summarize the things that got added and dropped because of, of this, it's that uh, info leak and error handling uh, fell off for the reasons uh, we mentioned. Uh, we also had uh, malicious file execution in the previous version of the top 10. And that was um, primarily a PHP flaw. And in terms of prevalence on the internet, it was relatively high because there's a lot of PHP applications and many of them had this particular flaw in them. Well, the PHP world uh, was already aware of the issue when we published the top 10 and was already working on the problem and now they've made this issue uh, off by default in PHP so it's much less likely a developer is going to introduce that. So there's still again legacy PHP apps that haven't been updated might still have this issue but the prevalence of it certainly uh, dropped significantly uh, in, in, the, in that time period. So that's why it fell off the list as well. So we had room for two more things. And so why did we choose the ones that we chose? Well, in 2007, we did, I think, a disservice to people focusing on the risk of their applications. We looked at the top 10, and probably because we needed to make room for something like CSRF, for example, we needed to drop something off the list. And we were like, well, let's get rid of that configuration thing. That's on the bottom of the list. Let's get rid of that. Because that's not really a developer issue. Right? And so we did. And then we started thinking about it later, and I'm like, well, if we're focusing on risk to your organization, then the security configuration of your application environment is hugely important. Have you kept up with your patches? Do you have it configured properly? Have you turned things off you don't need? And it's not just at the underlying infrastructure level, it's at your, web, your, your actual libraries and of course the configuration of your application. So uh, one of the things I emphasized in, in the, the security configuration section um, is that it's not just about patches and updates and things like that, it's about all your libraries. So for those of you who are developers or manage development teams, think about your current process for keeping up with the versions of all the libraries your application uses. Do you even have one? A lot of, I teach a lot of classes and I ask, I've asked this class question every class this year and virtually none of them say they have any reasonably strong process in keeping up with the latest versions of their libraries or just being aware that there's a new version. It doesn't mean I expect like automatic updates but being aware there's a new version and then understanding is there a security difference between those two versions that's important to me. So to illustrate my point here is last week or the week before, I forget the exact timing, there was a, two big issues that were published about spring security and struts security. So now we know there's two issues. The spring and struts community are rushing out patches. They're probably already out there. That's great. So the bad guys know about the problem. The good guys have fixed the problem. But what percentage of the applications deployed have the update? Probably today, very, very small, because it's not just like download, install, done. It's like grab library, give it to developers, do a lot of regression testing, make sure it works, and then deploy an update. And that process takes months sometimes in most organizations. Even if they start today, it might be two months before it's deployed. And yet, a lot of organizations aren't even focusing on do they even need to do it. So then it doesn't happen for a year. Two years? Never? So that's one of the reasons why your configuration, in my opinion, deserves the top 10 list. And not only did it deserve the top 10 list, it jumped right into the middle of the top 10 list as about A6 in the list. So the other thing we added was insecure redirects and forwards. And a lot of people have known about this issue for a while and up until about a year ago, I wasn't really aware of how prevalent it was, but I did a survey within my company and said, hey, how often are we finding this? And they're like, oh, we find it a lot. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's just our clientele. So I went around and asked 
a bunch of other vendors in my space about whether they're finding it. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're finding it a lot. So that is the new item that we put in the list. We're trying to obviously bring some sunshine into this problem. Um, obviously, we were pretty successful about that three years ago when we added CSRF to the list because most, when we published it, most of the community was like, what is that? I don't even know what that issue is. Oh, well, they read about it. They kind of make sense. And they look at their application, and sure enough, they're vulnerable. Well, I mean, in our experience, 90% of the applications out there, or 95 back then or more, were vulnerable to this problem. Obviously, that vulnerability um, percentage is going down, but it's still a, a very, very high problem. So that's sort of like the summary of, of you know, where we went to to get to write the new top 10. So this is the, the, the chart of the new top 10. And by the way, this presentation is already online. If you go to the ASAPI, or sorry, the ASAPI, that's my other project, the OS Top 10 project homepage, this presentation is already there. It's been there almost the same day that the new Top 10 came out. So if you want to use this. No. So this presentation is like 45 slides long, or 42 or something. And I'm not going to go through all of them in, in any level of detail, because we only have 30, 35 minutes. Um, but it's intended to be a presentation to deliver what is the top 10 to people that aren't familiar with what's in it? So if some of you wanted me to go through this in every little detail, I'm sorry I don't have time, but this is available. So if you're an expert or you know all this stuff and you want to evangelize the top 10, grab my presentation, take it into your organization, your event, your lunch meeting, whatever it is, and use it. And I, of course, when I published the new top 10, I had a bunch of people immediately going, well, where's the updated presentations? Because I want to pitch it. I'm like, oh, hold on, you know, kind of one thing at a time. So I went off and, and updated it, and I got it out there. But then I haven't heard anyone since, because they go to the project, they see it's there, and presumably they've been doing, grabbing it. And it's been downloaded, you know, thousands and thousands of times. So please reuse this. Obviously, our mission is to evangelize the top 10. Um, so please reuse my presentation. So how did we calculate risk? in the new top 10? Well, we had to come up with a model. So we started with the OWASP risk rating methodology, which probably many of you have never heard of. The OWASP risk rating methodology is a, a simple web page where uh, some people put together some stuff. I think Aspect wrote a lot of it, which is my company, and other people contributed. And it's a very simple model. It basically says, you know, select your likelihood factors, select your consequence factors, and then give them some ranking, and then generate a multiplier, and then that'll, that's how you can score your application, right? So the OWASP risk ranking methodology had eight likelihood factors and eight impact factors. Well, that was a little too sophisticated for the top 10. Uh, one of the main reasons it's too sophisticated is there's a lot of application specific details in that rating and obviously in the top 10 I don't know anything about your application. This is a generic list, right? So we just decided to say well we're gonna have one factor impact and we'll call that high, medium, low and that's it. But we also decided to break likelihood up into some things that we could think about a little bit. So prevalence of the flaw is certainly one of those factors. In fact that was the driving order, driving mechanism in ranking all the previous versions of the top 10 was prevalence. So that's why cross-site scripting was number one in the previous top 10 list, because it's clearly the most prevalent application security flaw on the web, and I think, in fact, in the entire space of application security right now. So prevalence, clearly an important factor. So then we thought, well, what else do we know? Well, What's the odds that an attacker could find this flaw in your application if it was even there? Is it really, really hard to find? Or is it relatively straightforward to discover? So that was the weakness uh, detectability factor. And then finally, we said, well, some of these exploits are easy to use, and some of them are kind of tricky. Like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, for example, are two of those that even when you find them, it's not like you just use them to reach right into the server and steal all their data or change new accounts or whatever. 